Hey guys, it's Tori, and today I'm going to be doing the Jane Austen at Home tag. This tag was originally created by Tilly over on Tilly's shelf, so I will link her original video down below. I was actually tagged last Jane Austen July by Berna from Berna's Bookish Adventures, and it's just taken me this long to get to it. I had fully intended to just do it in between Jane Austen Julys, but I kept having to postpone it and postpone it, and then finally I was like, I may as well just wait till July and do it then. So we're finally doing it, so thank you, Berna, for tagging me. I will not be tagging anybody myself in this video just because I know a lot of people did do it last year and I don't want to double up for anybody. So if you have not done this tag and you would like to, please do it. I would love to see your take on some of these questions. This tag was originally inspired by the book by Lucy Worsley, Jane Austen at Home, which follows Jane Austen's life through the homes that she lived in. And I actually just started reading this book and I'm already really loving it. So definitely excited to continue with it. And the questions for this tag are based on homes within Jane Austen's novels. So let's just get right into these questions. I will of course be reading off of my computer so I'm going to be looking at it. Usually I try to just write down the questions elsewhere but for some like this one they include the questions include other quotes and things and so I want to make sure I'm capturing the whole thing. So the first question is Mansfield Park the grandeur of the house astonished but could not console her. Name a grand book that may May or may not have been difficult to read. When I think grand, I obviously think long and beautiful, and my favorite large and beautiful book is Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. I absolutely adore this book. Not only is it super long and well written, it also is bringing together multiple different plot lines, multiple different lives, and just creating a world. It's not just certain people's stories. It's a world of France that we just aren't able to experience nowadays but that many people did experience and of course it is often over dramatic and made to be a story but there's a lot in this that was coming from Victor Hugo's real experience in France and it's just absolutely well done. I have been dying honestly to reread this book but because it's so humongous I feel like it's the type of book that you can't just decide to reread one day. I feel like I have to prepare for it so maybe sometime next year I'll try to but I would definitely define it as a grand book in many different versions and definitions of the word. Question two is Barton Cottage, which is in Sense and Sensibility, and the quote for this is, in comparison of Norland, it was poor and small indeed. Name a book about a household in difficult circumstances. And I think there's obviously a lot of books that have this as a theme because it's just such a common driver of drama and a common theme in dealing with grief and dealing with just life struggles. And so having a family that's dealing with life struggles is just very relatable and also puts forward the action. But the one I decided to go with, even though I had several options in mind, is one that the plot of the book is really spurred on by this family being in difficult circumstances. Even though it's not necessarily a major part of the plot, it is a driver of the plot and I just think it's very interesting how it comes about. But that is Agnes Grey by Anne Bronte. The premise behind this is that Agnes Grey is the youngest in this family and they end up falling on hard times and she wants to go out and help her family to improve their situation, take care of themselves, and despite the fact that her family all sees her as a sweet, innocent child that needs to stay at home and be protected, she wants to really seek out her independence. And I think what stands out to me about the fact that this family is in difficult circumstances and how that spurs along the plot is that it's very representative of Anne Bronte's own experience. Obviously, we don't know for sure everything that went in on in her brain and how she felt about certain things but based on what we do know about her it's easy to see that her family was also in difficult circumstances she's also the youngest of her family and quite possibly felt that people treated her as a child I mean even the way her sisters did write about her and things we're still able to read you're able to see that they see her as a sweet innocent little thing and she probably felt like she wanted to find independence and that's why she really pushed herself into governess positions positions and maintained her position as a governess much longer than either of her sisters because it was her way of finding independence and of finding her own personality in a lot of ways and identity. And this opportunity for both Agnes and Anne to leave the home came about because the family was in difficult circumstances. So I kind of like how this story shows that good things really can come out of poor circumstances, particularly as a lot of other 
stories focus just on the bad that comes out of hard family situations. And so I just really like how that is brought into this story. Question three is Hartfield, which is in Emma. I believe few married women are half as much mistress of their husband's house as I am of Hartfield. Name a book that you feel entirely the mistress of. This one was a bit tricky for me just because while there are books obviously that I consider favorites, I don't feel like I've like read them enough or know them quite as well as I would like to, to where I could say I'm the mistress of it. But one I am going to say because I'm on my third reread of it right now and I'm very deeply invested in annotating it, studying the language and everything. So I feel like I'm gaining a better perspective of this book than I have of many others and I feel like a a lot of other people probably don't have the same intense perspective of it because I have reread it at least three times and I am diving deep into it this reread which if you've watched my more recent videos you might guess what I'm going to say but that book is Tess of the D'Urbervilles by Thomas Hardy. This was one of my first classics that I ever read and definitely the one that I first really fell in love with and like I said I'm on my third reread of it. I'm almost done with it and I've just been really deeply annotating it, looking for foreshadowing, beautiful quotes, symbolic things, and that process has really helped me feel like I know this book a lot better and so especially compared to how I know other books and so I feel like this is one that I would have to say that for. There's another one I thought of that I actually will mention for another question so I'll get to that when I get to that book, but this one is the one I decided to go for for this question. Question four is Fullerton. Now there was nothing so charming to her imagination as the unpretending comfort of a well-connected parsonage, or something like Fullerton. Name a book containing a contented family. I believe Fullerton is in Mansfield Park, but the book I decided to go for for this question is Little Women by Louisa May Alcott. I do have multiple copies of this, but I am putting a picture because I have just packed them all out. I'm going to be moving in the next couple months back to my parents' house, hopefully as temporarily as possible, but that's just where I'm at right now. And I've been slowly trying to bring my books back so I don't have to do it all at once. So um, I did pack up my Little Women copies, so I don't have them, but here's picture like I said. This is of course another one of my favorites but it is one that has a much better family dynamic than a lot of the other classics and just books in general that I've read. Things aren't perfect of course as their father's off at war and it's not like they get along all the time but they really feel safe there and I think that really comes through throughout the book and throughout adaptations that they feel safe in their home amongst their family and that's one of my favorite aspects of the book is just seeing this family that's not perfect that all has very different members but they are able to make it work and I think it gets easy to expect things to be perfect and if they're not perfect they're not the way they should be whereas that's just not how life works and I feel like this really approaches that very well and I just really love I really love this book this is another one I want to reread specifically I have an annotated edition of it that I might read for Christmas might read in December because I just it's one I really want to get to and I think it will take me some time so I think reading it throughout the month of December will just add to the Christmas magic. So we'll see what happens with that, but that is a possibility. Anyway, that's my answer to that question. Question five is Rosings Park, which is in Pride and Prejudice. He declared he might also have supposed himself in the small summer breakfast parlor at Rosings, a comparison that did at first convey much gratification. Name a book that other books are constantly being compared to. So of course, Rosings is the home of Lady Catherine de Bourgh, and Mr. Collins has a tendency to compare everything Thing to Rosings and to Lady Catherine. At first I was going to go with Pride and Prejudice because I do think many things, anything that's Regency era romance is most often compared to Pride and Prejudice, but I decided to go a little different and decided to go with Wolf Hall by Hilary Mantel. I feel like a lot of historical fiction tends to be compared to this as this is such a big one and so well done, especially like more literary historical fiction I think is often compared to Wolf Hall. In addition, I think a lot of Tudor historical fiction may be compared compared to Wolf Hall at times, and I understand why it's a beautiful, masterful work. It's not a favorite of mine necessarily, but it is definitely a masterpiece, and so I can totally understand why people would compare things to this and why so many people really appreciate it as a work. So yeah, definitely one that a lot of people compare other books to. Question six is HMS Sloop the Asp. Quite worn out and broken up, I was the last man who commanded her. So this is from Persuasion, specifically it's Captain.
Captain Wentworth's ship that he commanded, as suggested in that quote. And the question for it is, show us a book that is looking the worst for wear. So I'm a little sad because I forgot that this question was part of this tag. And like I said, I've been recently packing up a few of my books and one of those books is probably the one I would show. I honestly don't have any that are super worn out or anything. The one I would have shown you, and I would love to put a picture of it or something here, but I it's packed away and I'm not going to go get it out. So I, it's just, I'm not able to show it really. So I'll describe as best I can. It's a work by Anderson, a collection of fairy tales by Hans Christian Andersen. And it's one that my great aunt actually gave to me. And so the spine is kind of coming undone. It's a little rough around the edges. Again, not quite as bad as some people's I'm sure, but it is definitely an older book and you can tell that it feels kind of fragile. So that's what I'm going to go with. And I'm sorry that I can't show you, but um, yeah, that's what I have. Question seven is Northanger Abbey. An abbey, yes, it was delightful to be really in an abbey, but she doubted as she looked around the room whether anything within her observation would have given her the consciousness. Name a book that wasn't as creepy or dramatic as you thought it would be. So I really don't read a lot of like creepy books. So I'm not going to go that route. I'm going to more focus on the dramatic aspect of this question. And the book I decided to go with is Five Dark Fates by Kendara Blake. This is the final book in the Three Dark Crowns series. And I just really expected it to end much better than it did. I was very disappointed by the ending, which is why it's actually in my unhaul pile currently this series. I honestly kept it a long time because I really liked the world building in this and I felt like I would be willing to reread the series just for that. But there are a set of little novellas that are associated with this series. It kind of came halfway through the series. And honestly, those two, well, one of those two novellas captured this world and created a story that is my favorite part of this whole series, which is kind of sad because it's not really directly connected very well to the rest of the series. It's just kind of a fun side story about a personage who is mentioned in the history of this world. So anyway, I just ended up deciding to keep the bind up of those two novellas and Dead and then get rid of the rest of the series since it was so disappointing to me and that at least captures what I really liked about the series and what it offered me as far as world building. So that's a whole other ta tangent. But anyway, basically the story just ended like how it always said it was going to end like and not in a beautiful, well done way either. I mean, the ending has a lot of dramatic aspects to it for sure, but I feel like there were a lot of things that could have been built on to make this more complex. And maybe it's just because this is a YA series that made it so Kendara Blake didn't make it as complex as I would have liked it, but it was very disappointing for sure. I had hoped for a much more dramatic, well-rounded, bring things together kind of ending and it just did not give that to me and I was really sad about it. Moving into question eight, we have Portsmouth, which is also in Mansfield Park. And the quote for that is, the smallness of the house and the thinness of the walls brought everything so close to her that added to the fatigue of her journey and all her recent agitation, she hardly knew how to bear it. Name a book that disappointed you when you revisited it. So this one's a little bit tricky for me because most of the time when I read read books I like it just as much if not more than the first time I read it. I decided to go with one that I have reread multiple times and the first time I reread it so the second time I read it I was a little bit disappointed by an aspect of it but then I reread it again and absolutely fell in love with it and it's one of my favorite books ever so it's kind of a weird situation but there was a time I reread it and liked it less and was a little disappointed by it but that is Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte so the first time I read it I actually didn't really like it but I read it for the summer and then we went into school and discussed it in class. So it was a summer reading kind of thing. And when we discussed it in class, I really ended up finding a love for it, developing a love for it. And for a long time, I considered it a book I really enjoyed, but then I reread it and there was a portion in the second half that really kind of bored me. And so it was a little disappointing because I had kind of built it up in my mind after that discussion and was really hoping to enjoy it even more than I did the first time. Thank you. 
because the first time I technically hated it. But then, like I said, I reread it again just recently, actually just last year, and it's now one of my favorite books. I absolutely adore it. I'm so glad I've continued to revisit it because it is such an interesting story that I can completely understand people hating. Like I completely understand it, but it just works for me and I absolutely adore it now, but it did disappoint me at least at one point. Question nine is Kellynch Hall, which is in Persuasion. The quote is principal seat, Kellynch Hall in the county of Somerset. Name a book from your ancestral home. This was a bit tricky for me because my parents have a lot of books and I haven't really taken many myself. I've taken a couple, but they're not really, I don't know, ancestral home makes me think of older than just my parents. And so I wasn't quite sure where to go with this, but I ended up deciding on choosing a book that's not officially a book, but it was written by my grandpa. And that is just the book of his, the story of his life. He just recently printed it, was kind enough to print it out for me and send it to me for a graduation present. My grandpa experienced a lot of hardship when he was young. He was the youngest by a lot of years. He didn't really have much relationship with either of his parents. I mean, he lived with his mom, but they were in and out of halfway houses, just in really difficult situations. He often says that he feels like he never had a conversation with his dad ever. And his dad for a while had abandoned them. He was an alcoholic and very much struggled with that. And eventually when he came back, it was because he had developed liver cancer and he only lived with them about a year before he passed away. And so it was a very complicated growing up situation. Um, and so he wrote down a lot of his experiences and gave it to me. So definitely one I'm excited to go through. I just recently received it a couple weeks ago and I've been really wanting to start working my way through it slowly. But yeah, that's the one I decided to go with for this particular question. And the last question is Pemberley, of course, from Pride and Prejudice. They had now entered a beautiful walk by the side of the water and every step was bringing forward a nobler fall of ground. Name a book that you are ready to dive into. So this was a little tricky for me because I'm ready to dive in just about every book that I own, but one that I know I'm going to be reading very soon, getting to in the next few weeks before the end of the month, at least starting, that I'm honestly pretty excited about, even though it's a little intimidating to me, and that is Waverly by Sir Walter Scott. I have owned this for a long time. I've thought about this for a long time, and I'm really excited to actually get into it. I am a little bit nervous that I'm not going to end up liking it or that I'm going to end up struggling with it, but we'll see. We'll see how it goes. I'm hoping for the best. So overall, I am definitely ready to dive into this as soon as I get into a position where I can once I finish tests and some other things, then I'll be very excited to dive into this. And the bonus question is, which of these households would you most like to live in? And I would say of the ones within the questions, I, like many other people, would say Barton Cottage. I think many of us feel like, especially in the modern era, feel like the humongous houses that are prevalent in Jane Austen's work seem a bit overwhelming and a little bit too much work to deal with. So I'm going to add my name to the list of people who would like to live in Barton Cottage. I keep calling it college. I'm probably cutting out all of that, but I keep calling it Barton College and I don't know why. Anyway, however, if we were to include other houses in Jane Austen that were not included in these questions, I would probably say Longbourn because again, it's smaller, but I just feel like there's a great community surrounding it based on what's in the books and I just find that really attractive if I were to choose one of the big houses. I think I would choose Hartfield just because of the good atmosphere that the wood houses bring into the home and so yeah I would probably say that as my big house I'd want to live in but I would probably prefer a little bit of a smaller dwelling than that. So yes that is it. Let me know down below some of your answers to these questions as I would love to know as well as if you've read any of the books I've mentioned, your thoughts on them. Again, if you have not done this tag and you have a channel, please do it. I would love to see your thoughts on these questions, your answers, and I hope you're having a wonderful Jane Austen July. Happy reading, and I will see you next time. Bye!